Hey everybody, this is Jay Eisenicki, and this is episode three of the Latent Force Prepared Defensive Action Podcast. Today we're going to discuss everyday carry and how we're set up for most situations. We believe there's no defensive situation so bad that your lack of training can't make it worse. We're on a mission to cut the crap in the firearms industry and bring you only the most powerful, impactful, and useful discussions and tips on mindset, gear, and personal defense that is designed to make you a more informed and effective gunfighter. Guys, gals, and submarine racers, here are your hosts, Jay Eisenicki and Mike Garza. All right, well, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today for episode three of the Latent Force Prepared Defensive Action Podcast. My name is Jay Eisenicki, and with me, as always, is my favorite co-host, Mike Garza. Mike, what's happening? This is this is the first podcast that we're live, like live together. Usually we go cross cross state lines. We might have to pay, I don't know, tax stamps like you do with SBRs and suppressors. I don't know. I don't know how that works. <laughs> but yeah, this is the first time in the same room and Jay has fed me and has given me plenty of alcohol. So we might have to do a lot of F bomb editings, but I'm gonna try my hardest. Yeah, for we'll Apple. To, I don't yeah, we, we have that clean label, so I guess we, we can't get too crazy. But yeah, we can we can beep stuff out. <laughs> so again, it, it, people are gonna start to wonder because here I sit again. <laughs> it's only the third podcast, and here I sit with a bottle again of High West Campfire Whiskey. Um and there you sit with a bottle of Crown Royal. So things are uh getting dangerous a tonight. very big who bottle knows of crown. who knows what's going to happen so you better just stick with us for the next 45 minutes or so but hey today is like the second or third or 12th i don't know what day it is of shot show and uh you know we would be not doing a service to our fans if we didn't at least talk about shot show so instead of talking about who we met and who we took pictures with and everything like that i thought we'd talk about what is the most popular thing so far with everybody on Facebook has been our bingo card. <laughs> now, I, I, we and I guess what we're looking for, Mike, right, is some input on some of the things that we should put on our bingo card for next year. Yeah, so we were kind of looking at our bingo card, and, and it, it still applies, but there are some maybe maybe variations that we need to do. So, for example, I, I'm not a sniper or anything, so I, I didn't get thrown out of the counters counter what is it counter sniper booth for shot show but i did get thrown out of a booth we're not going to say which booth because then that way they might ban me for next year so i i still like to go back and still look for the innovative folks out there right yes so i i can confirm that <laughs> that mike was asked to leave um for his controversial comments which we've come to love uh, with with one of the uh, vendors there that uh, claimed, man, I almost want to just kind of. It I was mean, the dumbest thing. Everyone should know if you if you don't know what the dumbest thing at Shot Show was this year. Hey, I give him an A plus for marketing. Oh yeah, no. I give him a below an F <laughs> rating for for their ingenuity. I don't I even don't know. know. I don't yeah, know what I, I want to call whatever. it. It's completely pointless. <laughs> But whatever. So, yeah, I, I think it was just a gimmicky thing, and everybody's talking about it. So apparently, that's what uh, that's what works. But so, what are some? What are a couple of the things on there that that are uh, that give us a kind of a rundown of what's on the bingo card? Well, if you if you go to the Facebook page, obviously you'll see the actual bingo card. But uh, a couple of good ones are uh, bees ridden <laughs> booth babes. Uh, those are those are in, in abundance. So if you know anything about Shot Show, you know that the AVN is at the same time as Shot Show. So your uh, your uh, babe, what do they what do they call them? Uh, range bunnies yes, by day, gun bunnies, and vixens by night. <laughs> ah, yes, yes, the gun bunnies. That's right. 
So, I, and I know one of the controversial ones today at SHOT Show that I was not allowed to X out on the card, although I think it's BS, <laughs> is a gunny sighting. Now, we all know who we're talking about, uh, and and uh, I did actually see gunny at SHOT Show. It just didn't happen that he was in person. It was a video playing on a screen in the building at SHOT Show, so I think that counts. A pixelation of Gunny is not the same thing as the one that you can touch. Okay. It just doesn't it doesn't work Whatever. that way. <laughs> this will go down as the controversy of all controversies. So so what else do we what else do we have on there? Uh, let's see, there's another good one, uh, airsoft crap. We definitely saw some of that. Uh, stupid and pointless new item. I think that also qualifies under being ejected out of a, a certain booth. <laughs> hey, I didn't think about it. You got a twofer on <laughs> that's that a, one. That's, that should count for at least yeah. a, like a bonus bingo, like right. a, maybe a multiplier times two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, let's see, what's another good one? Oh, silencers. Yeah, it's amazing how many people can crank out silencers. I, I mean, it's it's amazing to me. Uh, and, and it all at different points price points, which is actually kind of a good thing, I guess, right? Capitalism in America is alive and well. Uh, and then, oh, the, the milk crate on wheels. That by <laughs> far is the best one ever. Jay got run over today. We almost had to come and, and apply our EMT skills <laughs> to save his ankle, exactly. but luckily it was just a brush. Yes, yes. <laughs> and And so we're trying to figure out some new ones to put on there. And based on our experience today, is whoever, I think one of them is not only get kicked out, but you also have to be detained <laughs> by SHOT Show security and 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 getting, I don't know what you would call it, but yes, I was detained today because I did not, and given the, you know. Are, are your feelings hurt? They are, just slightly. Okay. I, are you I, offended? I'm, a, I'm offended. <laughs> And so they, they didn't like the way I was holding my badge to get in. And so they, you know, proceeded to tell me I couldn't go in. And I said, well, help. Anyways. <laughs> so I think getting hassled by the SHOT Show security staff getting has got to be handled. Yes. yes. <laughs> prone, getting proned out by the SHOT Show security staff <laughs> should be one of our squares. That might be a slight exaggeration of what happened. When you get thrown against a wall, not really proned out, it doesn't really count like that. Hey, <laughs> So I guess what we would be looking for is, as your feedback is, what are some of the things we should put on our, we're going to have an official for SHOT Show next year. We're going to have an official latent force SHOT Show 2019 bingo card. And we have some ideas that we're kind of rolling around our head. It's probably going to take us almost up to SHOT Show next year, just to even make them happen. But we need to some ideas of what to put squares down for what we see out there. Like we talked about the the little pin lady that had like 6,000 pins the on flare. her. The flare? Yeah, the, the flare. Yeah. I'm not saying that you have to have more than three pieces of flare. I'm right. just saying that. Are you saying you don't have enough flare? I, I don't. I okay. definitely don't have enough flare. All right. So give us, send us an email to podcast at latentforce.com. And uh, give us some of your suggestions or just go into any of our Facebook comments when we post this podcast up and give us your suggestions. So anyways, so we've consumed some time here talking about that. I wanted to get to our point of this podcast, which is uh, discussing everyday carry and what Mike and I do for everyday carry and what we do in different situations where we can't carry every day. Now, I would say that this episode has – this is the third – well, actually, it's the fourth version of this podcast. <laughs> one of them, <laughs> with the best one, didn't get recorded. So that's just the way it goes. So we we want to kind of go over some of those things. So we have some ideas of what might be helpful. But I wanted to talk specifically about a, a quick discussion about something we talked about in our previous podcast, which had to do with something that seemed to be uh, – common sense. And we talked about the FBI statistic last time about being safe in your home and that 65% of criminals enter through your front door, your back door, or your garage doors. And it seems very simple and almost a no-brainer because it is common sense. Um, But here's a story that I read. It was here in Las Vegas. A woman became the victim of an attempted sexual assault when she took her trash out and left her door open. Now, she was in an apartment complex, and uh, she left the door open, took her trash out to the curb. The uh, perp entered the home through that unlocked door and went and hid 
inside of her bedroom in her in her closet because the door was obviously uh, unlocked. And then he hid in there until she came back in the house and locked the door. And now she is locked in her home with the perpetrator who's in her closet. And then eventually when she made it into her room, he jumps out of the closet, attacks her. Fortunately, there was another woman that heard the, the ruckus was there and was able to kind of fend this guy off. Um, so her screams and everything were heard by this other lady. She came to help her. Unfortunately, both of them were beaten pretty good. And then he took off and he's currently still at large. So again, when we talk about some of these things seem so simple, but there's a reason that they, there are statistics on them because stuff like this happens, right, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. You know, sometimes it's almost like you have to think about the common sense thing. And I I think there's plenty of people that say it, right? Common sense is no longer common. But again, you you have to think about what would, it's, it's always the easy things that, burglars, thieves, all those kinds of people do. So they're looking for the simple. They're they're not looking for the complicated because they don't they don't know how to deal with the complicated. They're very simple people, right? They're just looking for the easy access and that would be one of the easiest things. Number 1, you should keep your head on a swivel. If you don't have your head on a swivel, you're you're doomed to fail. So again, luckily that nothing happened to her and she was able, you know, to thwart that situation. Yeah, I mean, it could have been a lot worse. Fortunately, there was somebody else there, but it just goes to show is that, you know, um, and and we're going to have a discussion about some of these other things that people don't even think about that can actually lead to you becoming a victim. And we'll talk about it here in probably the next podcast or two. We're going to invite one of our good friends, Rich, who's nodding over in the corner, who doesn't know that we volunteered him to be on a, a couple of shows later, but we're going to talk about some of those things about how to keep yourself from being a victim and some of the things you may not even think about, about what, and he's going to speak to some of the trends and things that are happening to, um, to people out there that you may not think about. So we'll talk about that. But again, it's simple. Lock your doors, lock your windows, and 65% of the crime that happens, burglaries happen from those things that are unlocked. So, all right, I think we beat this one. The horse is dead. The, the bush is on fire. <laughs> Something like it's that. all of it above. All oh, above. Whatever. <laughs> That's right. So, so let's talk about our favorite topic, which is pocket dumps and kind of where they come from. And, and I'll be the first to admit is that my pocket dumps are not sexy. I've said it before is that I usually have chapstick, lint, paper clips, and you know maybe some hand sanitizer. That's about it. But people take these pocket dumps pretty serious, right, Mike? And they kind of get it's just kind of a social media phenomenon. Yeah, on Instagram. And I've seen people like yelling at each other almost like, your pocket dump is dumb and you should carry a mag, more mags and a bigger gun and a bigger knife and you should carry a machete on the back of your back. I mean, it, it, it absolutely gets nuts. And my EDC is probably just as sexy as Jay's. And I the only one upper that I try and do is a tourniquet. And the only reason why is because I've learned my lesson from an EMT class that I took. So, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. And I guess the funny thing to me is that I have never, ever, and I don't know anybody that has ever, ever actually done one of these in real life. So this is completely staged, in my opinion, for uh, Instagram followers and some that type of stuff. Because you see these guys carrying, I just don't know where they put it all. And I know now... You're going to say because they have cargo pants. (laughs) Whatever. We're going to talk about cargo pants later. Your cargo pants specifically. Okay. Anybody's cargo pants is what we're going to talk about. But still, nobody's ever really done those in real life. And, 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 And I guess what it raises up is that is a question is why do people carry so much stuff? You know, to me, I'm a minimalist and it should be slick and easy. And I don't understand why people carry so much stuff when they go and they do that. So the question is, is there such a thing as too much? What do you think? Well, yes and no, right? So again, it's all situational dependent. Are you going camping? Are you going to SHOT Show? Are you going to your office? Are you going to have your vehicle available to you? And Big shout out to Daniel. He he was also kind enough to send us an email about what he thought, you know, the pocket dumps were and everything. Uh, so it just, again, it just for me, it's situational dependent. It 
I'm not going to carry the kitchen sink if I'm just going to work. Why? Because I have a kitchen sink at work. So why would I want to have two kitchen sinks, right? So that's kind of where I, that boils it. That's I have a line that I follow. Now, yeah, can you get caught out in traffic and now all of a sudden you need a Gerber tool? Sure, but those are the chances you take. However, if you're traveling on a busy highway, what are the chances that some guy might or might not stop and they will have a Gerber tool, right? Or the wrench or whatever it is that you're needing. I'm just using the Gerber tool as an example. So that that's kind of along the lines of where I think. Well, but still, when we talk about everyday carrier EDC is that there's got to be some things that are the essentials. I mean, there's got to be a list of things that everybody should carry regardless. And so there's got to be, if there's a maximum, there's got to be a minimum. And I, th- I think that maybe... As we go through this, we'll talk about some of this stuff with some of the things that I recommend and then some of the things, Mike, that you recommend. We'll we'll kind of get into that a little bit. And then maybe you guys can determine from that. Um, You know, we'll give our recommendations and hopefully that kind of paints a picture of what the minimum should be. But I'd be curious to find out from everybody that's listening. And again, podcast at LeightonForce.com or put in the comments uh, on our Facebook page on this podcast is what is your everyday carry? I mean, realistic, not not this, you know, Instagram um, stuff. It, it's the real thing that what's your minimum and what do you carry every day no matter what? Because I'd be interested to hear because I think that we're probably not too far off of what normal people that aren't trying to get followers on Instagram do. So, Well, let's, let's take a look at today. So let's take a live example. So we, we went to SHOT Show. We dumped our guns. Why? Because SHOT Show does not allow personal firearms. So I dumped my gun and I only carried my knife, my pen. I have a tourniquet on me. I always have a tourniquet on me. Uh, I carry a cell phone and I carry a little iPod. And that's it. That's all I have for that. So in that example, I didn't know what the security was going to be like at SHOT Show. I didn't want to press my luck. I'm always bending over and picking up things because I drop business cards and stuff like that. So I didn't want to print, you know, I always carry at the four o'clock position. So I just didn't want to take that chance. Uh, And this is not my home state. So I don't, I I know the laws here, but I didn't want to push the envelope, right? In Arizona, the laws are different. So, so that's a prime example of Mm -hmm. me changing, changing my EDC to meet my demands for that day. So again, not Arizona, uh, it's Nevada. So that's that's where I would change. In Arizona, you will be hard pressed to find me without a gun or two, maybe three. <laughs> so and my rifle, and you know. So th- again, that's that's what I was saying in the beginning. It just depends on what my day to day operations are going to be like. Well, and then on top of that too is that you know we. Uh I, I joke and I and so it gets into this conversation for me is what kind of pants you're wearing and I know that <laughs> seems like a really crazy thing to talk about is there's a lot of people that you know Mike you're, you can't be caught anywhere without cargo pants and there's a reason for it but are you a jeans guy or gal are you a jeans person or are you a cargo pants person and I, I mean to me I, I don't get the whole point of the cargo pants I mean I, I get when you talk about it I get it but I just, I, I'm not going to do it, I guess. We, we, and this is, so going back from the first three episodes that we tried to record, again, my butt does not look good in cargo, in, I'm sorry, in jeans, right? I just don't have a, a butt that, I don't have a badunkadunk. Is that what you call them? I, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> it seems like every time we do one of these, I have to put the too much information in. So again, so if I'm not going to look good in jeans, I'm not going to wear them. And then I might as well carry a bunch of pockets. And my three kids always have runny noses. So I have to have one cargo pocket just for snotty tissue. So that helps out in that department. Yeah. But I mean, it is something to think about because I, I mean, I agree and I get it is that, you know, if you have jeans, you only have a couple of front pockets and back pockets and they're not very big and they're usually a little bit tighter to get your hands in and something else. So I mean, it makes sense, but it really does, if you're going to wear a certain kind of, you, the setup is different for cargo pants versus jeans. Sure. And you just have to, you really have to think about that. So for me, I thought we'd talk about then. So what is what does everyday carry mean to me? And then Mike, what's, what's it mean to you? So not that I'm going to do all the talking, but 
for me, the biggest thing about everyday carry is that it's more emergency based. And I don't think it's necessarily uh, the boogeyman or something like that is always going to be in your in your situation. But there can be emergencies of all kinds that you have to be prepared for. And not all emergencies are re- going to require a firearm or um, deadly force. So we should kind of prepare for it that way. And, you know, so to your point is if you have a tourniquet, well, that's preparing for an emergency that could be anything. It could be a car accident that you witness walking down the street that becomes necessary. So, you know, just think about how your setup is more not necessarily for the worst day of your life and deadly force encounter, but it's also for the things that can happen um, that are in emergencies where if you're a relatively prepared person, you can render aid, you can help somebody in a situation. So for me, we talked about it before, and I think I wanted to kind of talk on this one is uh, trip wires. And for me is that in order to really be a prepared person, I think you have to have a set of um, of trip wires. Now, we are in, sitting in the booth today listening to a guy talk about the Tuller rule. <laughs> and so I didn't want to correct the guy. He was very nice. He was a very nice gentleman. But the Tuller rule is not a rule. The Tuller rule is actually a drill. And that drill is intended for an individual to determine how far is the threat zone for you if a person has an edged weapon and how much distance they can close when you react, draw, and fire two rounds center of mass with the intent to stop that threat. It's different for everybody based on your skill, your speed, your reaction times, your awareness, all of those things change. And so you need to know claim that it's 21 feet a person can close 21 feet you may have heard it as the 21 foot rule a person can close 21 feet with an edged weapon and strike you before you can draw your gun and fire one round so if that's the case then 21 feet is a tripwire that you have to be you have to be thinking about you say well okay well where are the rest of them so you would want to have one that's at arm's length because the world is bad if you have a threat within arm's reach of you. Inside your arm's length, that's bad news because a blade in that distance is, they can stab you 10 times before you can do anything. So that that's a bad place to be. The next one is your arm's length plus the other per- other person's arm's length. So you basically, that's somebody that would be swinging something like a bat, a club, a pipe, or something like that. Is they're outside your arm's length, but they still can reach you. That would be another tripwire. The next one would be whatever. And so you have a kill zone, which is in that arm's length, a danger zone, which is the next lay, the next trip trip uh, wire, and then the next one would be that threat zone, which is basically that tooler drill is to find out how far somebody can cover before you can react and get two rounds off. And then to me, the next one is 100 feet. And so given that we've done, I don't know how many students over how many qualifications over seven years, it's, let's say, about five 6,000 qualifications done, I feel relatively comfortable in saying that the majority of people are not 100% accurate at 25 yards. So that's about 75 feet. Right. Without fail. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a hard, that's a hard number. Yeah. I'd stand by that. So to me is if somebody's there is a threat that you would need to use deadly force with your gun, a hundred feet is a maximum because now you're, you have liabilities flying. So you have to be aware of that. So anytime something happens that trips that wire, you have a prepared defensive response to that. So you, those trip wires are important because it goes into how you carry. So those things are important. All right. So I just covered that because I know we talked about it in the previous one and, you know, what are trip wires? What does it mean? So each one of those um, represents a something happens and it, it triggers a defensive response in your plan. Okay, so enough about that. So we talk about um, carrying every day. And there's four things for me that I think are most important to carry. And I'm a minimalist guy, so I'm going to carry the least amount that I can to get it done. So for me, it's going to be a gun. It's going to be a knife. It's going to be a flashlight. 
and then it's going to be a uh, cell phone. Mike, what what is it kind of set up for you? I mean, what is what are the minimums that you carry? That that for me, it's almost exactly the same. The only thing I would add is a pen, and it's not like critical, but for whatever reason, I just like to carry a pen. Okay, so when we're talking about carrying on your belt or in your pocket, and we've got those things, and this is the order: cell phone, flashlight, knife, gun. And you would work from four to one based on location and restriction. So if you go somewhere where they don't allow you to carry a gun, you still have a knife, flashlight, and a cell phone. Now, I did go to the Barrett Jackson over at Mandalay Bay shortly after the Las Vegas shooting on October 1st. And they didn't even allow us in with a knife. So I didn't carry a gun in. And when I got to the security, they wanted me and said, no, you can't carry it. They were wrong, whatever, but I wasn't going to argue with them is they didn't allow me in with a knife, so I had to go hide it in a plant. So, But I was still in there with a flashlight and a cell phone. And you say, well, what is a cell f- why does a flashlight even matter? Well, there's low light everywhere, even in the middle of the day. Outside, there's still low light. And you need, so having a flashlight's important. It's, I don't know any place. You said you had an experience at a nightclub or something where they didn't allow you, or a party or something that they didn't allow you with a flashlight, but there's... V- that's going to be the super exception. Yeah, yeah, and again, if you know, if you're skillful at your craft, I mean, seriously, a flashlight, they're not going to trespass you and send you off to see the judge for a flashlight. The judge is going to laugh and he's going to throw it out of court. So. Right. So a flashlight is an important thing to have because it's going to help you navigate when in an emergency when lights are low. Uh, if you're in a mall and you have to take the back Um, passageways behind stores. If you didn't know they're there, they are there. If the power is out, lights out, natural disaster, whatever, you're going to need a light to be able to navigate through there. I'm going to tell you that any flashlight you carry on you has to be a minimum of 100 lumens. 200 or more would be great. And the reason why is because that light needs to be powerful enough to go across daylight, lighted areas to light up a dark area. So you want to make sure you have a powerful one. Um, The only thing I'd add to the cell phone thing is obviously that's to call in you have an emergency is situational awareness. And we say that all the time. People say, oh, yeah, situational awareness, situational awareness. Well, if you get on your cell phone, you don't know where you are and you can't tell them. I remember going through uh, and I got grilled any time I got on the radio. I had to always know where I was. What are the cross streets? Where are you at? And so this is important is you got to know where you're at when you're calling for an emergency telling people this is my location you know and, and it's funny you you say that it's really hard to do a lot of times so we we play these what if games in our brains if you do this long enough uh, another good one to do is what highway you're on and what mile marker you're at yeah so th- that one i i have i even to this day i still struggle but i still play the game just just because just you don't know if you're gonna your car all of a sudden you're gonna blow a serpentine belt that's the one single belt and that's going to disable your car. And you're in between mile marker 224 and 225. Did you remember the last mile marker that you went by to, to dial on a cell phone and say, hey, I'm, I'm stuck between 225 and 224? Yeah, because it's going to increase the time that it takes for people to get there when you say, I'm stuck between mile marker 56 and 224. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's a little bit of area yeah, to cover in you there. You might want to narrow it down just a little bit. But it's important is if you're under stress, you got to be paying attention to that too. So if you're in a in an emergency situation, it's going to be harder for you to remember and think about where you are if you aren't doing it when it's not an emergency. So that's, that's one of the big things. Um, for me is I'm a backpack guy. And when I say I'm a backpack guy, I am not camo, desert tan with a bunch of uh, Velcro on it, morale patches. I'm just a, a regular, I don't know, what is it, Swiss Army knife, black and gray backpack that you see. I mean, it just blends in. Tommy Hilfiger? Uh, no? A mm, little bit above the paycheck? Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. Kmart? Walmart? I don't I don't know if Tommy Hilfiger makes a makes a backpack. We'd have to. We'll research that. We'll get back to you on that. If we find one, we'll put a link up. Not that we recommend <laughs> it, just so it answers the question. At any rate, um, so the backpack's important. Now, Mike, I know you. We see this all the time. Is people just aren't aware of what they do. So a backpack is a great thing, and the reason why is number one thing is is I can carry more stuff in it. So I when I carry on my belt, I'm only going to have my gun, my knife my uh, cell phone, and my flashlight. I don't carry 
typically a reload. I only carry the magazine that's in the gun. We can have that discussion, which we will, is about whether that's the right thing to do or not. But to me, that's running as as slick as possible with not as much bulk, and it's and it's easier to conceal that. So if I'm going to carry a backpack and it's very it blends in, nobody thinks anything about it. I can carry all the extra stuff that I need in that backpack. So that's kind of my reason for it. And that's, I think the reason most people do, but they make the mistake. I believe just my humble opinion is that they broadcast to everybody that's has a clue is that I'm telling you, you got a, you got a, what is it? A high and tight and you're carrying a desert camo bag. You probably with, have a gun with all your patches on it that say I'm Tactical and yes. Black Rifle Coffee Company, even though their coffee's awesome. I mean, listen, I, I get it, but at the same time, you have to have some kind of OPSEC, at least, you know, some standard operating procedure that doesn't broadcast, you know, try and hit me first because I'm the guy that's going to roast you. So. so, the number one problem I see with people that carry backpacks and try to be tactical with their backpacks is they carry it on the wrong side. And you say, well, it's a backpack. How can I carry it wrong? Mike, how do people carry backpacks wrong? <laughs> well, if you're carrying your weapon at your fore and you have your backpack slung on your right shoulder, do you think you might have a problem grabbing your gun with your backpack getting in the way? I think we may have found <laughs> I think we may have found another square for bingo. Oh, now yeah. there you go. See, is somebody that has their mag in backwards? Hold on, let me let me get my pen and write this down okay, on a piece please. of paper. <laughs> ah, the piece of paper folded up in your cargo pocket. That's right. <laughs> So I think we got that would be one of those. Is we've seen plenty of those where they have the mag in upside down, facing the wrong direction, whatever. But anyways, yeah, it's covering your gun, and so it's and it's having it, it's obstructing your path to get a good primary firing grip to draw your gun. Yeah, that's supposed to save your life, and here you are with your bag over your gun. It's just crazy. Yep, absolutely. So then we talk about well, what's going to be in the bag? So. I mean, that's really the big thing is that, okay, so I got it. So I kind of give you the the thing is the way that I look at all of this stuff is the same thing. So I'm going to start at the last thing that I would have in the bag. If I could carry everything in that backpack, this is everything that I would have. And it's also, I'm going to start at the stuff that I would get rid of first if my economics didn't allow me to have it all. So the first thing would be small spare items an extra flashlight, extra batteries, a charger, perhaps a backup gun, any of those type of things would be some spare um, small items that you'd have in there. Next one would be food and water, Uh, like a Cliff Bar, Snickers, Gatorade. By the way, we're not sponsored by any of those companies. But if Snickers does want to sponsor us. We're open to it. Yes, absolutely. Yes. (laughs) One of the things that we talked about, which was an awesome thing, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was thinking, hey, you know, I get stuck in a situation where it's an active shooter or whatever. I got my pack and I got to sit there and the scene doesn't get cleared forever. And I got water and I got a snicker bar. And you brought up the point that you had just somebody at your place that got stuck in an elevator. Yeah, you know, and it's we, we, we were talking about that and it had just come up. The guy, they kept pushing the elevator uh, emergency button. The problem was is that the people that were supposed to answer that thought it was a prank call because it, it first plays this recording to tell them where the elevator is located at, what city, because we have a, a national uh, facility that answers that that telephone call. And so they would kept hanging up. So this happened several times. Eventually, the person in the elevator just got fed up and they just sat in the elevator thinking someone will eventually will understand that the elevator is not working. Well, we only have three flights of stairs at work. So people who just kept using the stairs and this poor guy sat in the elevator for six to eight hours, six to eight hours because he didn't care. He was getting paid. So and, and eventually someone said, what is wrong with the elevator? It hasn't come down in six to eight hours. And there you go. The guy was stuck in the elevator six to eight hours, no food, no water. It would have been nice to have a little Snickers bar again. I like yes. Snickers. Or Gatorade or water. Or yeah. Gatorade or water. Aquafina. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is you just never know. So after food and water is reloads or a bigger gun. So one of the thing that we're really uh, big on right now that I think is probably one of the um, – one of the best things anybody can do to be prepared is the AR pistol. And I think that having the ability to have reloads and a bigger gun in your bag 
is uh, is a fantastic thing. We were talking about this going around and looking and see how many people have uh, that SHOT Show are producing these AR pistols and have some really cool things. Is that something that's great to have in that backpack? And you're saying, well, man, that's got to be a huge, huge bag. And not the case. I mean, you can get, you know, folding stocks and eight and a half inch barrel, and you can fit that thing in your backpack, a, a larger backpack, but not some huge, huge bag. So if you can have more reloads and a bigger gun in, that's what I would do. The next one would be Mike carries that tourniquet in his pocket. I'd carry it in the backpack or and also an individual uh, first aid kit. So having something to um, provide first aid to somebody is something that should be in that bag so you have it. And again, my order of priority goes from that first aid kit and tourniquet. The very first thing you should stick in that backpack is that. And the reason... We, I went through the EMT class uh, last year in January, February time frame. I got turned on to it by a, a pretty good friend. The first thing we learned, and we, we get the LE portion of it also, so it's nice because it gives you the TCCC portion. And that's the first thing that they tell you is if you have a severed, a major artery, you're going to lose so much blood inside of a minute that you are toast, you're done. It's toothpaste. If you you can't once you get that toothpaste out of the tube, you cannot put it back in. So a tourniquet is life saving in those kinds of uh, predicaments. So that's that's one of the biggest reasons why I carry it on me, because if I have to say, hey Jay, go get my bag with my tourniquet, it's it might be too late already, right? So it just depends on where your bag is located on. If you have it on your shoulder, great. Then you've just averted a crisis. So, so I know in, with having a first aid kit and having some of those things to provide some some amount of first aid, you're kind of in a different – I don't want to say you're in a different camp that says first aid kits aren't important, but one of the things is is that you're not saying, hey, I need a bunch, a bunch of other medical stuff. I mean – Yeah, if you have you know superficial lashes and you're bleeding a little bit out of your arm, I'm going to cut your T-shirt up, wrap it around your arm, and call you good. We're, you know, if you're – again, if you're in the city – you're about 10 minutes to 15 minutes away from a major hospital, the EMT ambulance getting there, the fire truck getting there. So they're going to provide that kind of stuff. It's just like if you were allergic to bee stings. Wouldn't you carry a natropine pen? Uh, no, not a natropine pen. EpiPen. EpiPen, thank you. You know, carry that around for, with you. It's the same thing with anything else like that. Okay, so one of my observations right now is that... <laughs> my eyes are glazed? No. <laughs> is it... Is you're chomping ice, man. What, what, what's wrong with ice? I'm I, drinking. Okay, all right. Maybe <laughs> they don't care. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it, but to your point is that it's situationally dependent. So you could right. be in a different situation. You're saying, well, I'm in a major city. I'm 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes from the hospital, but you're up hunting and now you're hours and hours away. So now that first aid kit is a three day bag, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be a way bigger deal because it's the situation, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah, those are important. Um, and I and like I said, I think it, you just got to think again. The very most important thing is to have those first aid kits and tourniquets. The very first thing that you should have in that bag, and then build it from there with a uh, more reloads, bigger gun, uh, having the food and water, which is easy to put in there. I mean, just grab a bo- couple bottles of water and a couple Snicker bars. And then have those spare items as you're able to put them in there. So as we had talked about this, one of the things that came up was like, hey, well, you know, it's great that you have all this equipment, but what, where are you setting it up and how are you doing it? And so for me, um, you know, I am a, I kind of move around as far as where I carry. Uh, you know, I honestly, the most comfortable place for me is in the middle of my back. Problem is, it's not exactly convenient. Uh, especially if you do a lot of sitting, you know, there's advantages to every position. There's not one that's the best, um, but you got to go with what works for you. So um, I've tried a lot. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was running for the whole year. I was running at two o'clock, if you remember that. Yep. And I liked two o'clock and that's going to be weird. Everybody's going to say, well, your gun's in your pocket. Well, kind of. And where my hands are down there, it was a, it was good for me for the draw stroke. It was a compromise between four o'clock and appendix. The only problem is, is that the, what I found with that is it's great if I'm standing, walking, doing all those type of things. But as soon as I go to sit down a lot, it's just it's just uncomfortable. Um, 
appendix. I have no problem with appendix. I'm perfectly comfortable carrying there. I don't know why everybody's afraid of it. You just have to, you know, use your head. Um, it's just like anything else. I can shoot myself in the rear end carrying in the middle of my back or four o'clock. People have proved it to us. We've seen it. So it, you can shoot yourself from any position. Um, but again, it has its advantages, disadvantages to that. Um, so you have to really consider that if you're, if you've got a little bit of a tool, tool shed, if I can say that hey, county sized, county sized. that's yeah. what I w- that's the term I'm used to. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it, it's maybe it isn't as comfortable to carry appendix, um, in, in, you know, along the front of your waist. I mean, maybe it's not comfortable, uh, for a skinny guy who's got, you know, very, very thin. It's, uh, that's, that's a great place to carry. Um, so for me is I find myself between appendix and four o'clock. That's normally the two positions that I'm going to carry is appendix and four. Yeah. And, that, and that's where it breaks down into if you carry a four and let's, let's even say that you're not county size, but you're carrying at four and now you're in a seated position, like in a vehicle, mm-hmm. then maybe you're like, hmm, maybe I should carry an ankle holster for a bug gun. So at the very minimum, you can pull your bug gun, uh, sorry, backup gun. Uh, and then that way you can, once you get situated and out of the seatbelt, you can pull your four o'clock, which will be a little bit harder position to get to, but at least you already have a gun in the fight. Yeah. And there, and, and, you know, people will say, Hey, if I'm carrying appendix, I can just take it out and I can stick it in between the seat and the console. The only problem is that I have with that is that you're disconnecting yourself from your gun yeah. and that's, that's my issue with it. So I think you got to just think about how you do, um, how you do the particular carry because you spend a lot of time in your car. So that's one of those things that people don't think about. So that's why I don't like small of the back, although it's comfortable. Um, it just, if you're sitting down a lot, you're in your car, it's impossible to get to anything. Um, so I guess kind of the thing for me is also is, you know, what we carry in that particular, I'm a big fan. I know a lot of people like all the Kydex stuff and I, and I carry Kydex stuff, but for me, for the four o'clock, my favorite is the pancake holster, leather with a with the snap, uh, with a snap thumb break, and I think it just keeps a you know carrying a twenty two, a Glock twenty two, or a M and P forty five. It keeps it so much closer to my body. I, I think it's more comfortable for me, and it doesn't flop around. And so I like the pancake holster, uh, the leather type, uh, Bianchi Safari Land. Um, they make it that's, I've had that for years, for years and years. It's probably the first holster I bought, not the first holster, I bet. I mean, that's the first kind and type and brand. Yeah. It, it's funny. We, we were just talking about this today with someone else. And my biggest problem was, is I love lights on guns because again, you want to drive that darkness out so you could see what it is that you need to identify. So my problem was, is you get to these big name brands and sometimes they don't have, that type of holster with that type of light. I when Enforce the APLs first came out, I love them because of the big fat paddles that you could trip with your thumb, not your trigger finger. So finding a holster for my Glock with an Enforce was impossible. So that's when I started to make my own Kydex ones and I added the curve to my holster so that it you know to my fat butt so that I could get that perfect curve and so that it wouldn't it would pull my gun close to my body and still give me a very, very comfortable holster. Sure, sure. But not many people are going to be like, "Oh, let me start building my own holsters." It just, I get it. It doesn't work that way. So right, and and so that becomes a consideration is when you think about what kind of holster you're going to buy is you got to find the manufacturer. There's more to it than just um, you know reliability and 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 the support and everything of the, of your product that you buy from them is important. But do they have the ability to cover all the combinations and some, some don't, they just say, Hey, it's going to be surefire and streamlight. And those are the only lights that we're going to make holsters for. And another one is lead time. So I, I looked at G code, great holsters and everything, but some of their lead times back in the day were four to five months. Sure. So now you're not, you're looking at not carrying your gun with your favorite light for four to five months. So again, that's what kind of drove me to my direction to make my own for me personally, that way I can, you know, I could experiment and get something that I really, really liked that was really comfortable. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so for appendix for me is that I have the Safari land It's a model 27 and it's a nice heavy duty, 
uh, reinforced leather type with the with the liner in it. It's got a big, thick, wide clip, and that holds uh, very well inside uh, um, under your belt. It's got the uh, the J hook type, and you know that's that's what I like to carry appendix. But um, you know that's just you know I'm I, we were talking about this today. I'm I'm seriously am I find what works, and I stick with the one brand, and that's just. It's what I know. It's what I'm comfortable with. I don't like to have 50 million variables. I just like the same thing. And so that's what I stick with. If it's somehow tied to Safari Land, that's what I carry as far, you know, pretty much. I mean, that was my duty. My duty holster was Safari Land. And so that's just where I started. And that's what I've always carried. So just something to think about as far as where you position it is, is there isn't any, we've said this before, there isn't any wrong thing to do it's just what works for you and your situation and that's what you should go with so oh well we talked about the knives so i will touch on that is that you know i'm with you i carry the if i can if it holds an edge right and it doesn't fall apart when i open it that's pretty much the knife that i'm going to carry yes you know you don't need the 400 hundred dollar infidel from benchman although it's nice yeah Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, that's not necessarily the knife I need to carry every day. Yeah, when I wear my suit, I'll carry that one because I know that I'm not going to be opening cardboard boxes. If I pull that thing out, it's probably because I need to have the blood runoff cuts that they have in the <laughs> top of the blade. <laughs> it means I'm sticking somebody. Right. But yeah, um, I'm exactly the same. I, You know, I'll sharpen my knife, my everyday cardboard cutting, bag opening knife and that's what i use and i keep a good edge on it and that's it yeah yeah and i I mean i'm gonna call a little bit of uh a little bit of bs um (laughs) i can't imagine that i've i don't know if i've ever seen you wear a suit do you have do you actually own a suit it's not a suit per se it's uh it's a nice button-up shirt I, i have a tie every now and then the uh, the government does make me wear nice clothes once in a blue moon. so so you are aware that one of the main components of a suit with air quotes, is a jacket? I don't. I don't think that applies for Mexicans. I just FYI. I, I don't know. Maybe we can have some other Mexicans can call in and we can they, we can ask them too. Okay. And if that offends you, well, then you're listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, definitely. I think that those are things to think about. If you're going to have a knife, is that you're going to be using? It's got to be something that's uh, kind of a utility. So um, again, I think that those are going to be some of the things that you guys can look at. We we would encourage you to, again, provide us with some information um, that you guys have as far as what do you carry? How do you carry every day? What is, if you were to do a pocket dump, a legit one, what would you have if we asked you today, what would you be carrying? What do you carry every single day? What is the minimum that you feel comfortable carrying? And is there, if there's too much, where's that line for you? Because I'd love to hear what it is. And, and I think the value of your comments and people's feedback is that it benefits everybody else because there's plenty of people that are listening going, I'm not really sure, you know, Jay just said, hey, don't, he doesn't carry a spare mag and it's Joe Blow over here, he carries four of them, you know, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what everybody says. Yeah, you know, and it's funny you talk about the spare mag thing, I guess it just depends. I mean, if your neighborhood really requires you to wear three extra mags, I would behoove you to maybe find a new place to rest your head maybe that's not the place for you to be i agree i'm just saying (laughs) well on that note i think it's a a good place for us to call it an episode today i think we covered a bunch of really good stuff mike is any any last bit of information you want to throw out there no i i think we should start giving shout out to people that that uh focus our conversation and again shout out to daniel for reaching out to us on facebook and and kind of guiding our conversation as to what what he thought his EDC was or what he thought the pocket dumps were all about. So, Yeah, we appreciate your guys' feedback. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, again, shoot us an email to podcast at latentforce.com. That's where we'll get all that. Put it in the comments on Facebook. One of the things that we'd ask you to do, obviously, is to make sure that you share um, this podcast with, with your friends if you like it. Make sure to subscribe. Uh, make sure we're all on all the social media. So make sure to go and like us, follow us, do all those type of things at social media wise. And uh, I guess until next time, stay frosty. And that'll be a wrap for this episode of the Latent Force Prepared Defensive Action Podcast. Be sure to give us a like and a follow on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, or visit our website, www.latentforce.com, so you can get all the latest information from Latent Force. 
If you have any suggestions or comments on this show or suggestions for a future show, shoot us an email to podcast at latentforce.com. On behalf of Mike Garza and myself, thank you for joining us. Be safe, and as always, stay in the fight. Peace out. Thank <laughs> you.